I want to talk to you today about experiencing God's love. It's a very simplistic message, but it's profound if you actually experience it. God, the scripture tells us God does not possess love. God is love. 1 John 4 tells us God is love. It's who he is. It, it means it's not optional for God to love. And I want to talk to you today about things that if you experience the love of God, three simple things that, that, that experiencing, everybody say experience. I'm not talking about a theological belief that you just talk about, some kind of theological abstract. I'm talking to you about experiencing God's love. You know, it's a whole lot different when I was a kid, and I, I remember as a teenager I had crushes on girls, and, and most of them never crushed back. <laughs> and so I never experienced love. I just got the, like, you know, cold shoulder, like, yeah, let's be friends. Isn't that a great day? You know? <laughs> And so if you don't experience, but now that I've been married to Michelle this year for 30 years, and we, are, we just had our 30th anniversary, and 30 years together, we've experienced, I've experienced the love of a, an amazing woman, and, uh, and she gets a martyr's crown when she gets to heaven for, for being with me for 30 years. But, but here's the reality. If you don't experience God's love, there are things that will be absent in your life. You can be a Christian your whole life and still not come to believe and trust the love that God is toward you. In fact, 1 John tells us that we've, we come to believe and to trust and adhere to the love that God has toward us. So three things. And the first one, very simply, is this. When you experience God's love for your life, it provides you the ability to know your worth. It lets you know where your value really comes from. We live in a world that is, is like a giant sucking sound pulling worth and value away from human beings where people are, are, are driven to shame and, and, and pain, and then they medicate that shame and that pain with things like addiction and, and anger and bitterness. And until you know how to value, to, to literally establish the worth of a given thing, you don't know how to treat it. You know, when, you, if, when you, little kids come to your house, and we don't have little ones anymore, our kids are all in their 20s, and... Um, but someday we're going to have grandbabies, and I'm looking forward to absolutely ruining them. <laughs> I told my kids, don't ever drop your kids off and say, Dad, we don't like them to have sugar. I say, shut up. <laughs> when they're in my house, unless there's some kind of medical condition, they will get, they will get ice cream for breakfast if they want it. I so I don't, I don't like that, Dad. Shut up. I raised you. None of your business. I am the good guy. You are now the bad guy. <laughs> so I'm, get, I'm getting ready for that. But little kids don't know what things are worth. So you, you, you might have something very, very expensive or very important to you on an end table. When little kids come, you move them because they don't know how valuable things are. And they'll take something valuable and just throw it down and smash it. They just don't understand the value. And until you know your worth, you don't even know how to treat yourself. Until you know what you're worth, you will make decisions that will be contrary to how God sees you. And until that happens in a person's life, and we've all seen it happen in the, in the lives of people that we love. And we've all had it happen to us. We may not be aware of it, though. Can I tell you, in the absence of knowing God loves you, if you're a Christian for any length of time, you will end up being a mean Christian. And there's a reason. Because anything that takes away your worth externally, you'll fight. And so l let me explain it this way. Years ago, when I was, I was 22, so this would have been a long time ago, I was just, I just out of Bible school. I was a children's and youth pastor at a church over uh, in Midland, Pennsylvania. And, uh, and by the way, I, I checked last night. Any Italians here this morning, raise your hand. Just awesome. Well, they let, at least Italians were more. Last night, they made them all sit in the back row. But it's nice. <laughs> any Italians up, 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 upstairs, just looking around, it's an important thing. God bless you. It's an important thing. You say, why do you say that? I don't know. I'm Italian. It just makes me feel good. Yeah, it's a great feeling. Cornelius was Italian. He was the first one that came to Christ outside of the Jewish faith. Did you know that? He was Italian. <laughs> There's a theology behind that. It's thoroughly unscriptural, so I'll leave you out of it. But, it. but anyway, but there was this old Italian man in my church. My church was actually an Italian assemblies is what it really was from the old days. So everybody had a vowel at the end of their name. If you went to the board meeting, it looked like it literally looked like a meeting of like the heads of the of the crime families. But if you looked at their names, all right. And so, but there was this old man in our church named Angelo, and he was so rough around the edges. 
loud, uh, kind of gruff. Gruff is an understatement. Their 50th wedding anniversary, my pastor brought them up on the, on the platform, and, and his wife was just, the, she was a jewel of a woman. And he really was a wonderful man if you got down deep, deep, deep. You had to dig a little bit. But he, was pre- he really had a precious heart. And, and, and yet, the pastor hands the microphone to his wife, and I'd like to praise the Lord for, you know, lovely, what you're supposed to say. Gave the microphone to Angelo, and he said, I'd like to kill her for one year, one time for every year we've been married at least. And he handed the microphone back. And everybody in the church just went, how did that woman stay with that man for 50 years? But here's the reality. That's Angelo. That's just a piece of it. I, I can tell you Angelo's stories. We'd be here tomorrow. And you think, mercy. So I'm at this house party. And, and I'm just 22 years old. And it's a smaller home. And it's full of people. So it's very, very loud. Because, you know, people talking, even just low grade in a, in a small home. Just very, you know, just the sound is high. And so Angelo is upset because that home, they were going to sell it and they had it appraised. And Angelo, who, who, was, who couldn't read or write, was a steel worker, but was a pretty sharp guy, had bought, I think, eight or nine, or even, I think, if I remember, ten homes in that little steel mill town. So he felt like he knew the value of every house in that town. And the appraisal came in actually very high. And they were excited about it. And so you have to understand, I'm 22, and I'm being honest with you. I didn't know what an appraisal was. So I didn't deserve to be in this conversation, but Angelo didn't ask my permission. So he's just hot about this number, evidently. And I'm across the room, and there's all these people between us, and Angelo catches eyes with me. And he figures, I'm going to tell everybody what I think, but I'm going to use that kid to do it. And so he, I won't yell like he did, but he yells, he goes, Hey, boy! That's what he called me. Hey, boy! He called everybody boy that was not a man. He just looked, he didn't, if he knew your name, you were still boy. Hey, boy! And he screams it, and the room got quiet. He's making eye contact with me. And I went, you know, well, what? You know, I didn't know what to do. And he yells. He said, you want to know what this house is worth? And I really didn't. <laughs> but I'm just standing there. I'm just his prop, right? And he yells at the top of his voice, this house is only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. I don't care what the appraiser said, unless he writes a check, it's not worth a plot nickel. And I'm just standing there, I don't, I, I'm embarrassed, I'm, you know, because you feel like I got drugged into this thing, I don't even know what he's doing. The room kind of is awkward, and they're looking at him and then me, like somehow I asked, I didn't know, I'm just standing there. And Angelo, to my knowledge, I don't know if God ever used him in his life, but he did that day. 22 years old, I remember standing there, even feeling like that odd embarrassment you do when that kind of thing happens. And the Holy Spirit spoke so clearly to my heart. Here's what he said to me. He said, that's your worth and value to me. Your praise value to me is what I was willing to purchase you with. Your value is the blood of my son and nothing else. Let me read it to you in the scripture. Then I want to ask you a couple questions about it. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says this. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You were purchased with the blood of the Son of God. That's your value. Not who abandoned you, Not who divorced you, not who cheated on you, not what employer didn't do you right. Your value is not based on how much money you make, how many problems you have, how many successes you have. Until you learn to establish your value on the baseline of how God values you, you will always be chasing an unseen target. It will never be enough. Some of the wealthiest people I know have become wealthy because that's how they found their worth. I've sat at the deathbeds of some of the wealthiest people you can imagine, and they're as empty as the day is long. But they, 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 they they achieved great things, but it was to fill something that was already supplied in Christ. When he shed his blood, isn't it interesting when John baptized Jesus at the River Jordan and he came to him? And you know, right when I'm speaking right now, I just sense God's presence in this room. Listen, His presence is always here, but there's His manifest presence. 
There's some things He wants to do in your heart today that can change everything for you, whether you've been a Christian an hour or 80 years. And it's so important to grasp that in your heart today. But the love that God is toward you. Jesus, when He came to be baptized in the River Jordan, John did not proclaim, Behold the Son of God, though He was the Son of God. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, who will bear the sin of the world. Jesus came, He said, Sacrifice and offering, Father, you did not have for me, but a body you prepared me. His body became the actual vehicle to bear the sin of the world. And when he hung on that cross, the judgment of God that the sin of the world demanded was poured out on him. You know, the only time in the Bible you see Jesus calling his heavenly father God is when he's on the cross. When he says, quoting the scripture, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew his father and he knew his father loved him. And it's important that you get this simple revelation that the father himself loves you. The Father Himself loves you. He loves you. That's your value. That God so loved you that He purchased you with His very own blood, His very own life. And until that revelation center gets, gets literally believed in your heart, your whole life, you'll try to seek it outwardly. And, and your decisions will reflect it. You'll find, we've all seen the, the young woman or or, 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 or young man even, but typically it's a young woman, dating or married to a man who treats her like garbage. I've watched young girls date guys that, I mean, are brutal to them, even physically, and yet they marry them. And when you, and when you try to talk to her, and when the mom or the dad or people that love her try to talk to her, honey, what are you doing? She says this, he loves me. In other words, she's so desperate to be loved that she's willing to accept abuse to get a piece of love. And eventually he destroys her and finds someone else and leaves her. And then she finds that other man, a new man in the same body over and over again. Because what she believes about herself and her value, she keeps attracting people who will treat her exactly how she sees herself. And that's exactly what happens when you're worth is established outside of how God sees you. Nothing defines you but a Savior. Lastly, let me say this, and we'll move on. How many of you have ever received communion? Does not the Scripture tell you when you receive communion to examine yourself? Now, we always think of that, and it's accurate. Lord, am I living in a way that reflects your will for my life? That's, that's entirely appropriate. But I would ask you to examine yourself in this regard. What have you lifted up in pride? above the blood of Jesus in your life? What have you exalted above who he says you are? That's communion to me. See, pride is what you lift up. Humility is being brought low. Every time you serve, receive communion, I always ask myself this question. What have I lifted above how God sees me in my life? What have I made Lord? Have you made my past the Lord of my life? The fact that maybe your mother or father left you or abused you or abandoned you or an uncle or somebody. And then horrific things may have happened to you. I was married and my spouse cheated on me and destroyed me. All men are pigs. I'm telling you, they're all pigs. And you begin to get this bitterness in your soul. A communion is a time when you say, no, no, no. I am not. My value isn't based on a man that hurt me or a woman that hurt me or a person that left me. My, my worth isn't even based on my, my, good, my good decisions or my bad decisions. My worth is based on the fact that while I was yet dead in my sin and trespass, Christ died for me. He loved me before I was lovable. And when you get the revelation of the love of God in your heart and you believe it, you begin to discover what you're worth and the baseline of all your choices now are from a position that I am valuable before God. And if, when you understand that value, it changes everything. Second thing is this. The second thing you experience when, 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 you, 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 when you experience God's love and believe it, the second thing it provides is this, the ability to actually love God. You know, Jesus told us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Every time I read that, I feel a burden. And I feel a burden to be candid with you that I don't feel that I can ever meet. 
God, how can I ever love you completely? Michelle and I have been married 30 years. And I promised, and she promised me, that we would love each other fully and completely and selflessly for 30 years. And you know what? We haven't. Anybody here ever, ever, ever been selfish in your marriage? I'll try this side of the honest church. Anybody here ever been selfish in your marriage? We haven't loved each other perfectly. So I look at that, and I think, God, how could I ever love you that way? You see, believing God's love provides you the ability to actually love Him. It's so important. You know, as a little boy... As you can tell, being Italian, I'm, you could, how many of you know I'm not Swedish? You could see that, right? You know, can I tell you the truth? I didn't know I looked Italian until I met Michelle. I didn't, I, finally, we were, we were married years, and she said to me, she said, you know, you guys, you know, you all look so Italian. I said, do, do I really look Italian? She went, what's wrong with you? How can you not know that? But I was raised as a Catholic kid. And one of the things that I learned as a Catholic boy, and, I, and it was kind of skewed because I was maybe eight or nine, was that people that God truly loved and that were special to him, he did something that was termed st the stigmata, which basically meant that the marks of the cross would appear in your body, and it would be painful. The marks, like wo the wounds that Jesus endured on the cross would show up in somebody's body. Now, th that's certainly not biblical or scriptural, but the reality of it is, that's, now listen to me, that's what I believe God did to someone that he loved. Can you imagine how skewed my image of God was? If a parent did that to a child, what do we call that? Child abuse. So I remember at eight, nine years old, I wanted to know God just even as a kid. You can have a great desire toward God, yet not know God. Cornelius, the Italian guy I was telling you about, the Bible said he was a devout man. He prayed always. He gave money, but he didn't know God. He had to hear words whereby he could be saved. So you can have a great heart for God, but not know him yet. Eight or nine years old, I remember saying, God, I want to know you. So I went in my room, which I shared with I have four brothers, and, uh, and all the doors were broken, so you couldn't lock anything. Anybody with boys, you know exactly what I mean. And you have a circle in the wall where the, handle, where the doorknob went right through the wall. And we just destroyed the house, and my father refused to fix anything until he said, all of you animals leave, I will fix it when you leave. I, I crawled up on the bed, and I remember praying that God would do that to me so that I could have a close relationship with him. Now, obviously, he didn't, but I remember thinking it was about to happen. I remember starting to cry, thinking, this is going to hurt so bad. You see, if you don't know the love of God, you'll try to make God love you. You'll try to earn the favor and love of God. It is impossible to make God love you more. It is impossible to make God love you less. In your worst day that you'll ever have, the worst of the worst evil that any human being has ever perpetuated in, in, in life on this earth did not change the love of God toward that person. I didn't mean he approved of their choice. Doesn't mean that without Christ that there's still not a consequence. Doesn't mean that if, if, if I do things that displease God, doesn't mean there aren't consequences that life brings. It, it obviously it does. But it doesn't change the love of God that much. The scripture says this in, in John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Now, if you read that from the perspective of trying to make God love you or to make yourself right with God, here's how you read that. God, I prove that I love you by doing what you say. But that's not what he said. He said, if you love me. Say it out loud, if you love me. <laughs> if you love me. That's a question. Then you will obey what I command. The focus is on loving him, not obeying him. Obedience is the outcome of loving God. So how can I love him? It's the outcome of love. The greatest, the greatest impetus to service and love, and if you will, and, and sacrifice is love. Anybody have kids? How many of you could, would, could agree with me that your kids didn't earn anything you give them? My kids, I mean, we, I'm still paying bills for my kids. They're in college, man, and it, it ain't cheap. My kids get up every morning when they're in our house. All those years growing up, you know what, not one time, no one ever woke up and went, oh, mother, oh, mother, if it be thy will, shalt thou feed me today? 
Have I earned thy favor today, O mother, O mother, O mother? Feedest thou me, please, mother? I, I beg thee just this once. I won't make my bed today if thou feedest us this week. Is the, 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 the. Do you ever wonder why people talk to God funny? Because they don't believe he loves them. Anything you do extra to try to... Lord, we cometh unto thee if this dayeth. Can you imagine going to Walmart? Whereeth beeth the grocery of this? We're like, what? All these external things that we do. But my kids, man, we pour our life into them. Love. It demand, it's, not, it's not even optional. I love them so much I can't breathe. God so loved you, he couldn't breathe. You are his obsession. You, God, you are God's point of obsession. It is obsession to robe yourself in human flesh as the creator that you make. You, you become the creation so that you can judge their sin yourself. God's mercy boasted against his judgment. He said, they're guilty, and I'm a righteous judge, and there's a payment. So he said, I will literally become one of them, and I will bear their judgment. I will judge sin, but I will pour it on myself. He's obsessed with you. He's obsessed with you. If you love him, keep his commandments. 1 John 4.19 tells us this. We love him. We love because he loved us first. Until you believe God loves you, you can't even love him back. We love because he loved us first. It is impossible to truly love God at the level that, that is demanded of us, that is appropriate from this kind of sacrifice. Until you believe he was the initiator, he loved you first. And when you believe that, it changes everything. You see, you cannot freely give away what you haven't freely received. The minute you think you earn the love of God, guess what you'll do to everybody in every relationship? You will make them earn your love. If you're married, honey, will you do this for me? No, you didn't do that for me. Honey, can we, you, get out. You've got a couple days in a doghouse before we get to that. And I won't go into what that could be, but... Anybody, anybody alive in the house of Jesus today? <laughs> How many people in marriage give what the person deserves in your estimation? And that's, that's the downfall of marriage. Do you notice when people do wedding vows, they never say, I promise to love and blah, 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 if you ain't ugly. If you're always good to me. Do you ever notice at wedding vows, everybody promises what to give, and they leave that wedding altar expecting to take God, the principal action of love is giving. God so loved the world that he gave. You cannot be a giver out of a heart of love until you freely receive love. So believing the love of God equips you. Literally, it equips you to love God back. We love him because he loved us first. So the more I am convinced and persuaded to God's unconditional love for me, independently of anything good or bad in my life, not just the worst, not just the bad stuff, but even when you have a great week, the worst thing that can happen to a Christian is when they come back from a conference. They have three days away from everybody and everything, their spouse, their kids maybe, and they get three days and they come back and they're so close to God, and then you break the spell. Life happens. Husband, kids, wife, kids, whatever show up, and it's like, I was so close to Jesus, and you all ruined it. You weren't close to Jesus. You just got away from everyone in your life. Got away from all the crazy. And you somehow thought that was, I've had people, I'm, I'm on a fast to get close to God. Well, I understand fasting can do that. Fasting can shut your outer man down. All fasting does is let you live out of the truth, out of your inward man, and tell your outward man to shut up for a while. Oh, God will move if you fast. God wants to move all the time. How many of you know God doesn't move more if you're hungry? <laughs> so you, you, five people, two people can be doing the exact same thing before God. One doing it out of a heart of love and relationship. The other doing it trying to make God love them more. Trying to earn more and more of the favor of God. Finally, 1 John 3.16 says this. We've come to know how much God loves us from this. 
because Jesus laid down his life for us. Do you realize, think about it. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. This is how you know God loves you. Jesus died for you. When you believe that, not only does it help you establish your worth, it secondly enables you to truly love God. And Jesus said this, what would happen if you love me? If you love me, you will do what? Keep my commands. You want to be able to obey God with your life? Yeah, but Lord, I, I promise you, how many, anybody ever make a deal with God? Something bad happening, oh Lord, Lord, if you'll just help me this one time, I promise you I will, and you give God the five things you'll give up and do and whatever. Anybody ever done that? Am I the only honest one in the house of Jesus? <laughs> do you know every time you do that, you're shouting out, I don't believe you love me. God does nothing based on my promises. He does everything based on his promises. And it's critically important that when you believe the love of God, you come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to obtain help in the time of need. Grace and mercy. Grace, God's favor that you could never earn. God's ability, undeserved, poured into your life to do what you could never do without him. Do you know what mercy is? It's God's willingness, his desire to treat you better than you deserve. He calls his throne a throne of grace and a throne of mercy. Why? Because it's the only way I can get there. And he said, and you come boldly through the blood of Christ. Boldly. Because when I came to Christ, I became a new creation. I became a child of God. And I, I no more deserve what he's given me than my children deserve what we've given them. But we give it to them, and undyingly so, because we love them. The third thing will, that will happen in your life when you experience God's love is this you actually will then possess the ability to change. The parts of your life that you despise, the secret sins that no one knows about, the pornography addictions that are rampant in our culture today, just by percentage, this is true in the church and outside of the church, a percentage of people in this room watching online right now are addicted to pornography, and it's secret, and you've learned to cover your tracks. Let's just let that rest for a minute. Because now the shame is starting to come. Yeah, that's me. I, man, God, I promise you so many. Lord, I promise I'll never. And, and shame keeps driving you away from God. And eventually you become hopeless, which is exactly what shame is designed to do. To drive you away from the one who loves you, the only one that can set you free. And it's not just that type of addiction, any kind of issues in your life. Bitterness and fear, anger. Many people, their marriage is full of anger. It existed before you ever met each other. And it's, you've carried it your whole life. And by the way, you're about to transfer it to another generation. It doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't have to be that way. Romans 2 verse 4 says this. Or do you despise the, the riches of God's goodness? Or do you despise his forbearance and his long suffering? Not knowing the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Knowing God's love and that his goodness is toward you. The Bible said that's the path that leads men and women to repent. Repent is a wonderful word. It means to turn and go in the other direction. Something that you know displeases God. Something you know destructive in your life. The goodness of God is what leads you to do this and to go toward God for freedom. Most people do not know how to live free because they never receive the goodness of God. They think when they're bound is when God is displeased with them. And when they're, quote, free, that is when God is pleased with them. They think God is good to them when it's a good day. God is not good to them when it's a bad day. God loves me when I'm, when I'm doing the right thing. God does not love me as much when I'm doing the wrong thing. And all that does is trap you to where you can no longer find the path of repentance. He said the goodness of God will lead you like, a, like you lead a, like a puppy. Will lead you to be able to turn your life around. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll close with this story. When I was a, a kid... In college, I went to Clarion, up, up the road from here. And IUP and Clarion, I don't know if they still play in sports anymore, but th there was a bit of a rivalry back then in football and basketball. And 
when I was in college, man, I was, I was living so ungodly. I don't even know how to exaggerate it to you. But I, I took Michelle. We, this is the first time she's been to Indiana, Pennsylvania. So uh, we drove on the campus. And the last time I drove on the campus was when I came here for a football game when I was in college. A friend of mine was on the team at Clarion, and he was a senior. I think he was about a ninth-year senior, but that's my friends. But anyway, um, he said, Nuzo, because he knew I had a camera, he said, will you come to the game and take some pictures of me? Now, he's an interior lineman, so you've got to kind of, it's hard to get pictures of those guys. So I came here, and I went to the, to the press area, and I went up to the young lady there, and I said, uh, uh, I'm from the East Liverpool Review. That's somewhere in Ohio, you know. She said, I said, did you have a pass for me? She looked, she said, no. I said, oh. I said, all right. I said, uh, I said I'm sure they can find something else to put in the paper. Uh, she said, oh, no, no, I'm sure they'd want, they'd want the photos in the paper. And I said, uh, I said, oh, well, okay. And so she gave me a press pass. And I, it was like this sticker, and I, and I had I put it around my leg. It was just like, like a bumper sticker. It was awesome. They fed, they fed us at halftime like the cheerleaders. It was fun. <laughs> So I'm walking all over the field. And I'm not, you said, well, that, that you stole. Yeah, I, that was the least of what I was doing at that point. So I went all over the field taking pictures. I've had the time of my life. Went home, and I don't even remember how I got down here. Maybe hitchhiked. I don't remember. But all I can tell you is that that was, the, that was like the light side of what, the way I was living. That was just a, a cute, thievery thing. But here's the reality. I was living so ungodly. It was horrible. And my mom, like most Christian moms, are trying to come, make, you know, help me come to know Jesus. And so every time I'd be around my mom, you know how mothers drop hints. And man, I would just be like, man, can you get off my back? I don't want to hear this stuff anymore. I didn't say stuff. I don't want to hear about this. Jesus, Jesus. You live that nonsense. I don't want it. And by the way, if your kids are saying things like that, please, please, please. Don't think it's what they mean. There's so much shame and guilt in people's hearts that they think God could never want them. Ever. And so my mom, I'm home for the summer, and she says, now how about this? Do you, I have four brothers. You have to understand, four brothers in an Italian home. I'm, this is a home where it's just it's dangerous. And my mother comes in the room with all of my brothers and said, would anybody like to go to the Sunday school picnic this weekend? We're like, ooh, let's go pet, you know, Mickey Mouse when we're done. That'll, ooh, Sunday school picnic. But my mother is not stupid. She named these old Italian ladies, of which we knew, because Italian picnics are not like uh, a Medigan picnic. You guys have hot dogs, hamburgers, you know, watermelon, not Italian picnics. They brought roasters they plugged in with extension cords with cavatelle and brajol and meatballs, and peppers, and a sausage. And she named all these things these old ladies would make. When you would eat this stuff, you would see Jesus. <laughs> so I'm like, man, yeah, I'll go to that. Now we went, and of course we had to sit through the service, and he's playing the guitar, and outside, and like, ooh, you know, he preached, and oh, yeah. And I just, where's the food, right? So my mother brings me over to introduce me to this man. He ended up being my pastor. And, uh, and, and, and she said, John, this is Pastor Bill. And, and, uh, hi. and she goes away like thinking, oh, God, do your miracle now. So I never let him talk. I thought, you know what? She'll never do this to me again. I, I talked to him maybe three or four minutes and never let him speak. And I told him every vile thing I had done in the last year or two. I, and I mean with graphic detail. I'm thinking, you know, this pitiful preacher dude. I, I'm going to shock him. He, he'll, he'll blast me and this will be done. And I went on and on and on and on. And I said, and I'm about to go back to college and I'm going to do some more of it. And all he did, he looked at me and I mean, never blinked. Never changed his expression. Never gave me like the, you ungodly sinner, you're all going to hell. I didn't need anyone to tell me I was messed up. I didn't need a course for that. I knew that. You know what he said to me? And it changed my life. And it's why, gosh, 30 some plus years later, I'm talking to you about it. He looked at me and here's what he said. He said, John, you have absolutely no idea how much God loves you, do you? And I thought, he, he couldn't have heard me. He said, did you hear what I told you? 
And he never blinked. He just said, you know, he said, it's, it's obvious to me. You have no idea how much God loves you, do you? And he reached out his hand and he said, but it's so nice to meet you. And he walked away. I was like, dude, I didn't know what to do. I went back to college and I, and I started living the way I always lived. But, I, but those words, I would have used these words back then. They haunted me. Every time I'd lay my head on a pillow, I couldn't get past. Listen, one sentence of the truth of who God is, one sentence began to pull me out of darkness. One sentence that God could love me. God could love me like this. A little over a year from the day I met that man, I was in a Bible school obeying a call of God on my life. How'd that change happen? Well, you must have gotten serious with God. No, I understood God got serious about loving me. And just the entrance of his word gives light. He gives understanding to the simple. And when I began to believe that, and I didn't even have any reinforcement, but God by the Holy Spirit took those words. See, that's why you don't want to just lay guilt on people that you love. Well, I'll just make it. I'll, I'll tell you what, you're bad. You're good. You're not just change this. And if you can, I'll, I'll make you feel. All you'll do is help drive them away from God. Tell them the truth about who God is. I don't care what they're doing. No matter what the sin might be. You say, but are you saying if God loves you that you can live however you want? No, I didn't say that at all. But people are going to live however they want anyway. Why don't you tell them the truth about God and let God do the work in their life because he's the only one that can set you free and the freedom that came into my life because I the the entrance of the thought that God loved me in the middle of that kind of conversation from a pastor changed my life and so my hope for you today is that you'll believe the truth of the love of God toward you because when you do it will literally help you to know your worth it will help you to actually love God and lastly, it'll help you to change the things in your life that you're desperately wanting to change. Because there's nothing, nothing as powerful as our God. And our God is love. So let me pray for you. Father, I pray for every person here under the sound of my voice. Every man, every woman, every person watching online. That we would come to know and to trust and to believe the love that you are toward us. Father, I pray that no matter how people have come into this room today trapped and bound where on the outside they look free but internally there's chains lord like that day when your love was revealed to me if 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 spiritually you could hear chains began to rattle and chains began to fall off my life my prayer today is that by the power of the holy spirit the same god who loves me loves the people here those watching this that they will believe that love and the goodness of God will lead them to repentance. The chains that bind them will fall behind them. Father, I thank you for that. That nothing is, impo nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible with you. You are so faithful. You are so faithful. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as the Lord of your life, or you're not certain if, if you've ever invited Jesus into your heart, he only comes by invitation. Sir, ma'am, listen to me. You don't go to heaven because you're better than most people. You can't earn this only through a Savior. Well, I was baptized as a baby. I, I go to such and such a church. Listen, no church can make you a Christian. No sacrament of any church can make you a Christian, including this one. Have you ever invited the one who died for you into your heart? If you haven't, he isn't there. He only comes by invitation. He doesn't simply sneak in one day when you weren't watching. He only comes when you invite. And the scripture said, he turns no one away. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you'd say, I don't know that I've ever invited Christ into my heart, or I'm sure that I haven't. And I want to invite Jesus into my heart and receive the free gift of eternal life and be made brand new before my God because of the love and the price and the blood of a Savior. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you desire to be included in that prayer, I will pray for you right where you're seated, and then the whole church can pray that prayer out loud and together with you. So heads bowed, eyes closed, those of you online included, simply right where you're seated. Would you raise your hand high just so I could see it, and I'll pray for you right now, right where you're seated. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. I just want to make certain that every person, thank you, ma'am. God bless you. 
Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Listen, if you raised your hand or you should have, please pray this out loud where you hear it. Jesus will come into your heart. He will never leave you, never forsake you. And we'll pray it together with you. Pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear my sin debt. Thank you for coming into my heart today. I receive you now to be my Savior and Lord. I am now a child of God. My sin is wiped away. And I am heaven bound. And I profess that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen. Amen. Give them a hand, would you? Best decision of your life.